Germans can never really seem to trust Italians. If it isn't the sack of Rome in AD 410, then it's the sack of Rome in AD 455. Or the sack of Rome in AD 550. Or the sack of Rome in AD 1527. And if the seemingly innumerable number of sacks of Rome can tell you something, it's that the Alps aren't totally the best source of protection against invaders. With that said, if you're an aspiring northern Italian statesman of the 12th and 13th centuries, you should probably get yourself some friends to ward off any pesky household Germans. The Holy Roman Empire was pretty big, but it was also so disorganized that instilling any form of real authority requires enough mental gymnastics to tie one's entire nervous system in a knot. Emperor Frederick Barbarossa, though, was willing to give it the old college try, and even began the imperial diet, no, not that kind of diet, of Roncaglia to discuss the sovereignty of these small Italian states. One small problem. The Pope, Alexander III, was salty that his papal crown was being challenged by an anti-Pope. I can hear you right now. But this is completely unrelated. What's going on? Right, right. Hear me out. The anti-Pope, Victor IV, was smelling the fresh scent of power, and Barbarossa saw an opportunity. What if I support the anti-pope? Maybe he'll be my little pawns that I can boss around. <laughs> Alexander III, though, caught on to the plan, excommunicated Barbarossa in 1160, then prepared for the worst. Even worse for Barbarossa was that the Die of Roncaglia was officially rejected, because, seriously, why would you, as an Italian noble, willingly hand over your powers to some German guy you hardly even knew? Quite literally revolted at the idea of losing some of their autonomy, the Italian states of Verona, Venice, Vicenza, and Padova, plus a few others that the primary source refused to mention, formed the Veronese League in 1164. And, with funding from Venice, the Pope, and two unlikely allies in the Byzantine Empire and the Norman Sicilians, they were ready. Admittedly, though, the League was kind of, sort of, puny, and it only included two city-states worth mentioning. Barbarossa Le certainly thought the same way, though. And, even though the League was supposed to make him stop interfering in Italy, Barbarossa simply worked around it, and became even more of a nuisance. He even made sure to kick out all of the Italian representatives and replace them with German ones, that way, silly things like ties to land and local loyalties wouldn't be sufficient excuses to turn on him. When the cities of Piacenza and Milan openly resisted against the Empire, they were both promptly squashed. Either way, the increase in danger certainly didn't convince our good friend Alex, who was too busy hiding in France until it was safe enough to go back. A year after the formation of the League, he packed his bags and said, well, Sure, it seems like a good time to go back home, and threw himself back to Rome. The Veronese League, on the other hand, was an uncoordinated disaster, but it certainly managed to get enough people in northern Italy to get the same nasty attitude toward the Emperor. They overwhelmingly sided with old Alex against Redbeard, giving themselves the nickname of Guelphs, fighting off the Imperial Ghibellines. In 1166, the Emperor decided to use his brain, deciding that the best course of action against those pesky Guelphs was to land a blow on the Pope himself. He grabbed a bunch of his finest men, crossed the Alps, and by the time he reached Lodi, he held an assembly where he made his plans public. Many Italian clergymen and nobles begged, No, Barbarossa, why are you doing this? But Barbarossa continued marching south regardless. A lot of Guelph states were pretty grumpy at the idea of their lands being trampled over by an emperor who wanted to kick out their old pope and then replace them with a new one. The Italian representatives from Milan, Brescia, Cremona, Mantova, and Ferrara were the most grumpy. They gathered together, then signed an agreement to kick out the emperor. The representatives then all went back to the cities that they were kicked out of and then kicked out all of the German representatives announcing that the Guelphs would revolt against the Ghibellines, thus finally forming the Lombard League in 1167. A bunch more states would join the new league, including all the members of the former Veronese League, and at its height, the league reached a staggering amount of support, at 28 cities joining the Priory.
With the Guelph states finally united, a sort of cycle would commence. Barbarossa would cross the Alps a bunch, and then either the League would push him out, or there'd be a stalemate, and both sides just go home. Fifth time's the charm, though, no? <laughs> no? Not at all, because in 1176, Barbarossa barely even managed to make it to the Lombard city of Legnano, when suddenly, the Guelph forces caught him by surprise! Okay, it was not necessarily a surprise. Don't think of it as a coordinated as don't think of it as a coordinated effort on the Guelph's end, because they were equally a surprise to see Barbarossa marching towards their exact location. Neither side really had any plans. They just kind of saw each other and then charged each other. With the fact that there were no real plans in mind, it shouldn't surprise you that the subsequent battle of Legnano was an absolute mess. First, the Guelph and Ghibelline cavalries charged at each other. The two cavalries then duked it out a little bit, then the Guelph cavalry split up and retreated south of Legnano. The Ghibelline cavalry did not give chase and instead regrouped with their infantry and attacked the Guelph infantry. The armies clashed, and then out of nowhere the Guelph cavalry came in, who had themselves regrouped and attacked. The Ghibelline cavalry prepared to retreat, expecting the infantry to do the same. But there was no final retreat, but rather a chaotic bloodbath, where many were killed or captured. Barbarossa himself was almost captured, but he escaped just in time. But other than that, the battle was a tremendous victory for the Italians, and two treaties would be made celebrating the victory. And the first was the Treaty of Venice in 1177, a six-year truce which all major Italian players were invited to, the Pope, the Lombard League, and Sicily. In this treaty, Barbarossa was told to stop supporting that dastardly anti-pope, who was now a different anti-pope, and he agreed to it. This also had the funny side effect of removing his wife Beatrice of Burgundy's title of Empress, just because she was technically made so by the anti-pope, who was then also a different anti-pope. The second treaty, and argu arguably the most famous one, is the Peace of Constance. This truce is a more permanent truce, and it echoed much of what the previous Diet of Roncaglia said. Rather than taking away powers from the Italian states, though, it reinforced those powers. But it wasn't all bad for the Emperor, as he was now able to be seen as a true Emperor of the Italians. Something that, in essence, was what he wanted to begin with. And finally, Italy can be at peace. It's really thanks to the Lombard League that a sense of Italian unity could be achieved. Legnano was the only other city other than Rome ever mentioned in the Italian national anthem, and every year we Italians can celebrate the Palio di Legnano, a festival hosted on the final Sunday of every May, where medieval games and pageants are played, a special mass is performed, and we can all ignore the fact that Italy would form into another Guelph and Ghibelline war in only 30 years. <laughs>